so we're going to go ahead and get started today. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you for joining me. My name is Lana, and I'm your host for today. Today, I'm joined by Erica as my co-host, who you might have seen in our previous uh, podcasts. And today, we are joined by Dr. Kasha Smakowska. Smakowska. I think I got that there one right. There we go. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, so I'm just going to give a quick introduction of Kasha. She is the W. Benson Herrer Egyptology Scholar in Residence here at uh, Cal State San Bernardino. <laughs> that one's always a mouthful. Um, and uh, like I said, she's an Egyptologist, and her focus is in ancient Egyptian private religious practices, dreams, gender, and the archaeology of magic. Um, so super interesting. So we're going to kind of talk about some of the stuff that you uh, focus on in your study. So I'm going to start us off with, uh, I guess, our first discussion. We'll kind of go from there. Um, and I think to start off with, we should kind of make what are Egyptian demons and why do we call them demons and why are they different you know, from everything else? Right. So when, well, in all cultures, in all religions, there's sort of different kinds of beings, right? Different, different beings, sort of big gods. And then you have people and then animals. And in between, there's oftentimes these beings and there's oftentimes no word for them. I mean, even in English for things like leprechauns and fairies and goblins and gnomes and brownies and baba yagas what what did we call those you know there's no supernatural beings i guess you could call them so in right. ancient egypt it's the same thing there's all these beings that are in between they're not quite major gods so they have no temples dedicated to them necessarily perhaps hymns weren't sung to them but uh, nevertheless, they existed and were, you know, were very important. And so um, the term demon comes from a Greek word, daimon, which is a thing that's in between people and gods. So that sort of is a word that fits. Unfortunately, today, the word demon has a negative connotation, right? But it wasn't always that way. And these guys are, are sort of neutral. They're not necessarily negative or positive so it's just a word um you know i always thought they should be called um ben benevolent and hostile benevolent and malevolent beings for which there is no other term but that's kind of long right <laughs> so yeah so and uh so demon is just it's just a term to try and mm -hmm. encompass and use for all of them a word Right. Yeah. And like you said, I think definitely like in like the Western culture and, you know, the Judeo-Christian culture, the word demon, like you said, does definitely have that negative stereotype. You know, we think of, you know, the thing that hides under your bed or, you know, things like that. So it's interesting that, you know, we have that negative connotation, but that wasn't always the case. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, oftentimes they're actually neutral themselves. It just sort of depends oftentimes on your, your point of view. Um, I use the analogy of a bodyguard or a bouncer. There we go. A bouncer at a nightclub. <laughs> if you're not dressed right and he doesn't let you in, he's nasty, right? He's, he's bad. He's a bad guy. But if you're on the inside and you're like, oh, thank goodness he kept out the riffraff. From your <laughs> point of view, he's a good guy. And so a lot of these also had that sort of double nature, depending on the point of view. Right. That's interesting. Um, so my question is like, you know, I know how you mentioned kind of like we have like fairies and goblins and things like that. Was there something similar in ancient Egypt where there was like different types of demons? And if there are, is there one that particularly sticks out to you as kind of like your favorite or, you know, one that um, is particularly interesting? Yeah, they seem to have, um, again, they, they sort of categorized them in that usually they're referred to as a group oftentimes, but it's oftentimes a vague sort of name like protectors. Um, and, uh, you know, the nasty ones are just known as like enemies, male and female enemies or, or adversaries or those who pass by, which I always, I always like them because it's just this idea of this horde. I watch too much TV and I get this, <laughs> this idea of all these sort of like nebulous beings, just, just groups of them sort of passing by in the night, you know, making this whooshing noise. Um, but some of the, the nicer ones, they come in so many different shapes and forms. I have to say, my personal favorite is one that has um, the head of a rabbit. Um, 
and but has a big knife. Because I always, I just like the juxtaposition of, of what we usually think of as sort of this, you know, gentle creature. But, you know, the rabbits actually in Egypt weren't these gentle little bunnies anyways. They were hares. They were desert hares. And they could fight very, very fiercely. Um, I also classify beings like there's this little guy that later on sort of becomes a god called Bez, the Bez image. And he sort of starts off as being part lion, um, sort of like a dwarf. And he's, um, he was clearly popular in ancient Egypt. He continued to be popular up through Roman times, although he looks very different. And he is oftentimes shown at particular time periods with musical instruments and dancing. And um, he's, he's kind of fugly. So he's kind of cute and ugly at the same time. So you can't help but really like him. <laughs> Great. So what made you want to start researching more and studying more about demons and like the other smaller deities? Um, I, it, it all started with my PhD dissertation, actually, where I was studying dreams and nightmares. It started off just being dreams. And then I realized that there was actually more references to nightmares. And I realized, gosh, nobody's written about this. I don't know why not. I mean, and I started, you know, noticing these bizarre, strange, weird creatures depicted on furniture and headrests. And um, I mean, they're really cool. I mean, they're, they're depicted as dancing. Some of them have these like little crop tops and kilts. And again, they, they might have, you know, wheeled knives and snakes and be spitting snakes and be part crocodile, part human or even tripartite, these things that are, oh, there's one that's got the head of a, was it the head of a hippo, but it's got, oh, the face of a shrew. It's got a nose like a shrew and the snake coming from it. And I was like, whoa, these things, forget about the big gods. Everybody knows about those. These things, nobody's looking at and they're everywhere. They're all over the place. So um, that's what got me interested. I just come, kind of went, how come nobody's paid attention to them? why not they're really fascinating and uh are i think the reason they hadn't been paid attention to is because that they don't appear in texts so we have them as images a lot of them but we don't have anything written about it and reading the texts although it's difficult to learn the egyptian language once you do it's easier to read texts and sort of know what's going on then interpret objects uh, that have nothing, no other clues except for the occasional captions. So, um, and then I realized, hey, I'm not the only one working on these things. And I found two other scholars who are working on similar things from different time periods. So each of us sort of had our own little niche time period and uh, started a demonology project. And we, it, the term demon just came up because we were like, what should we call these things? And we wanted to pick something catchy. This sounds ridiculous, but we wanted to pick something catchy that people could find easily on the internet Wow! <laughs> when searching. So. Right. So speaking of, you know, finding things, um, you mentioned that there wasn't a lot of, you know, text about it. It was all just kind of like in the objects. So was it hard to learn more about them because of the lack of info? Yeah, it's, it's much more difficult and it's much more difficult to interpret. And it, it's actually, there seems to be the ones that the Egyptians found helpful and friendly sort of, those are the ones that you find depicted. And that's because the ancient Egyptians believed that the practice, the, the very act of writing or creating an image, whether it be a figurine or two dimensional can literally bring it into existence. So the malevolent one, the nasty ones, are only almost exclusively referred to in texts, but only quickly and just named like the damned, the enemies, the murderers. There's, there's two that have individual names, but that's it. And there's one that's depicted. Otherwise, they're almost always um, uh, not depicted. And in both cases, it's hard to get information because 
those enemies and adversaries, they're just referred to you. They'll come up in spells and the spells will say, oh, you nasty beings, you know, you enemies, things that are causing my head to hurt and my, I don't know, whatever, causing, causing pain in my head. And that's all you get. You don't get a backstory. They don't have any history. Um, the two that are named do have a history. And that's really interesting because even their parents are named. So it's kind of cool. Um, but otherwise they're not. And I think, again, they're not depicted because otherwise that would make them come into being, right? You don't want them to. Whereas the, the benevolent ones, again, are only depicted. So we don't know their names. I mean, I usually, you know, they don't have names. Sometimes some of them are referred to the word protection will be around there, the protectors, um, but that's it. No name, so, just just the, the image is enough. <laughs> so is Bez the only one with the name? Because I, I know you mentioned. Yeah, Bez. and even, yeah, Bez has a number of different names, actually. His, his, the earliest form is Aha, which simply means the fighter. So it's difficult also to know, is that a name or is that simply describing what he does? Um, and then there's some that, uh, their form can be used for beings that have names, uh, like Tawarit is one. She's a creature that is usually has the, um, uh, body of a hippopotamus. Um, and she's oftentimes has a, is in close association with the crocodile. And at one point, actually the crocodile gets fused to her and she's depicted with a crocodile spine. And at some periods of time, she also has little paws rather than hippo feet, which are very similar to paws, actually, if you look at hippo feet. Um, so she too has a number of different names, but when they're in the context of just being these protectors, no name is needed because you just see them and you know it's not, it's kind of like Superman, right? You recognize Superman by the cape and you know the big ass um, or Spider-Man who's got the spiders. <laughs> Right. all over his body he doesn't have to and even that he doesn't have a name right he's just spider man mm -hmm. so um i look at them kind of like superheroes in fact versus the villains yeah right i think you said earlier that a lot of these um deities are depicted on furniture um do you have you been able to come to any conclusions as to why that is yeah, I should say they appear on lots of different things. I just happened to mention furniture because that's um, that's what I've been studying recently. That early on they appear on um, uh, these sort of devices that the Egyptians used for protection, mm -hmm. and uh, that so there's sort of there's one group that appeared during the late Middle Kingdom, which is about oh I don't know let's say eighteen hundred to I don't know, 1600 is to be super rough BCE. And those appear on cups, can appear on feeding cups made of faience or clay. They appear on these wands, which are actually made of hippopotamus tusk, carved on one side and flattened on the other, um, which is why they're big. Um, I measured, well, I didn't measure. I looked at the measurements of a number of them and came to the conclusion that a lot of them must come from the male hippopotamus. Uh, and they also can the Bez image can appear as a figurine. The really wacky ones, like there's one that's a walking sun disc. It's just sun disc with a foot and a knife on it. Um, <laughs> that has no name. I just call it walking sun disc, walking on sunshine. Um, uh, those don't come as figurines, but what they appear on changes in different time periods. So in the new kingdom, let's say roughly, I don't know, let's say 1500 BCE, uh, they start appearing on furniture, like headrests in particular, bed footboards, chairs, the outside of chairs, uh, the legs of chairs as well. And uh, again, I think when you look at asking, you know, I always ask, well, why are they appearing on this furniture? Became an interesting question. You know, it's like, why don't they appear on uh, temple walls, for example. Mm -hmm. They do later on, again, in the Greek period, you'll find them on temple walls. But at this time period, you find them, you know, on the furniture, what is happening in the time that creates the need for them? You could think it's just an accident of survival. But that's all that's we found. I don't believe that. 
I think we have excavated enough that we have a good sample of things from different time periods. I could be completely wrong, of course, you know, tomorrow, a whole cache of things from, you know, I don't know, we could find some middle kingdom pyramid. Oh, here we go. Some late old kingdom pyramid where in, in the tomb chambers, instead of the pyramid texts, we suddenly find all these guys, but, um, uh, but that hasn't happened yet. They can, and they're usually not, they're, they're mostly found on things associated with the living as well, even if they're found in tombs. Because just because something is found in a tomb doesn't mean that's where it was used. So I could be buried with this amulet, for example, but that doesn't mean I created it in order to be buried with it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I didn't create it at all. Um, sometimes the representations do appear on tombs. So again, in the Middle Kingdom, at the same time as those wands and those cups, we find some tombs that have some of the odd beings appearing in scenes on the tomb walls, but not all. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, so I know that within history, you know, a lot of times when you have something that's adorned or something that's decorated, that's usually reserved for the nobility or, you know, the people who can afford it. Um, so were these objects mostly for, you know, the higher class or were there common people who were able to have, you know, their headrest with beds on it? That is such a good question. The, and it's such a, it's always really weird to, and hard to categorize the people in ancient Egypt. Unfortunately for the vast majority of people, the people, the farmers, the workers, the people who worked in all the gardens, which are never talked about also, there must've been loads of gardeners. Um, uh, if we just don't know, you know, we don't have their, their, we don't have the information and not much remains, nothing, very little remains of the settlements. Even the settlements that we have are fairly skilled workers usually. Um, so having said that, those skilled workers and those settlements, absolutely those people could have these. Uh, again, there's different types. You can have the same um, figure on a pot of clay. So for example, in the late Middle Kingdom, there's a beautiful faience vessel which was found in the city of El Lisht. Now, that's beautiful fans. It's beautifully, exquisitely decorated. That probably belonged to somebody who was rather elite. Mm -hmm. But in the Petrie Museum of Archaeology, you find this cruddy little cup. This is <laughs> the images, you can make them out, but they're not very good. They're just, they're just not. You can see it just wasn't made with quite as much care. So those would have been, you know, used... Uh, by somebody, um, you know, maybe it was used by an elite person as well, but it, it also would have been accessible to others. Um, and it's kind of neat because when you look at um, some of these, again, the objects, you can get a better insight into the lives of the people who didn't read and write, the scribes. Scribes tend to only write about things through their point of view where, right. for example, their job is always the best because <laughs> they're scribes. So why would you want to do anything else? <laughs> so so um, from my understanding, it sounds like these were very heavily, like almost personal, like religious objects or like deities. So how important, how important were they to like the larger Egyptian religion, like statewide? Yeah, uh, interesting. Um, so the temple religion in Egypt, sort of what was practiced in the temple, wasn't really for the benefit of people, more ordinary people. It was there, the job of the priests was to take care of the gods, right? That's what it is. And the gods would occasionally come out to see the people. So I think these fulfilled a need if you it allows you closer contact to the divine world without requiring a priest mm -hmm. without requiring the god to come out from the temple for you to see um uh some of these little things that i studied like the you know the, the bez image and tower and various others could be left as offerings as well but they could be also used in your own personal shrine in your home. So you can access it anywhere, anytime, anytime you need it, it's there. 
some they often appear on amulets. I can't believe I forgot to mention amulets. Amulets, of course, are covered in these, or there's loads of amulets with these various ones on them. Um, uh, and they could appear on, on, on papyrus as well. But uh, you again, you don't, it, it's ju it just fulfills a different niche. So the main temples, again, the main role of temples, one of them was to proclaim the royal power as well. So the outside is depicted, has depictions of the Pharaoh, you know, overcoming enemies and things like that. Cause that's the message it gives. You're not gonna find uh, a little, um, you're not gonna find a little walking sun disc on there, which offers protection during life. Cause that's not the purpose of a temple. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So it seems like, um, like as you were mentioning, for the common people, it seems like like the main you know established religion was kind of out of reach for them in a lot of ways. So would you say like these demons kind of fulfilled that role that you know like maybe you know the main religion was beyond them, but this is what they could have for themselves almost. Yeah. So if you have a stomach ache, um, you know you're you're gonna want the demon that's causing the problem inside you to to go away. Um, you know, one way to access the help is through, you know, um, a spell that calls upon, you know, beings for help, or if you're having nightmares, uh, you can call upon the great gods, a lot of spells do, but again, those are, those are spells that are recorded. <laughs> and it, it's, 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 um, which would have been accessible again to the literate, or they would have been read out loud by somebody who knew how to read. But even if you couldn't, again, I think these would offer comfort. Again, I thought it really kind of cool that earlier people were holding up their little creatures, their little helpful creatures. Like this was my dissertation bear. Yes, I had my advisor who I could consult, right, about my dissertation. But when I'm at home and I'm working on it, I mean, this little guy, it was the one who helped me and sort of gave me comfort. You, know? it's like, you can do this, you can. Um, see, he's still with me today. He'll help me write my next book. Uh, so yeah, and I think it brings us again closer. Uh, my interest again is the religion of the people rather than the Pharaoh and what he says happens and what happens at that sort of high level, the, you know, uh, philosophical um, level. And I think looking at stuff the things that people had in their home, especially from the settlements and the workmen's villages really gives us the best insight. And a lot of the objects that I work on, again, were not found in tombs at all. Um, I work on these clay cobra figurines, for example, which were used to, were sort of like demons in the sense that they are used to channel the energy of the fiery goddess and were used amongst other things to keep away nightmares. Um, and those, are not found in tombs, except for one single exception that was found in a tomb shaft and perhaps was intrusive anyways and didn't actually belong there. So <laughs> none of them were found in tombs. They were all just found in places where people lived and not in big temples either. So again, it gives you that idea of what other people were doing. Wow. And so I, you've mentioned, you know, like having like actually like little figurines and having, um, them almost like engraved within, you know, like pieces of wood or, you know, your furniture. Was there one that was favored over another or do you see examples of both pretty equally? The Bez image. Bez, 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 Bez <laughs> is by far the most common. Bez, and he oftentimes appears with the hippo thing. I call her a hippo thing, Taweret, because again, she goes by different names and, and, uh, um, but that, that hippo, but they will be like, I don't know, you could probably do a count. There's probably a three to one ratio, at least of the Bez image to her. <laughs> wow. yeah. So, and he can um, come in triplets and duels. Yeah, so. <laughs> so you were saying earlier that your initial research was on dreams and then it mm -hmm. shifted to nightmares. Yeah. Um, but my understanding of Egyptian culture is, or, and also of nightmares is that they're kind of negative and the Egyptians didn't really want to focus or like write down the negative. Parts. Do you know why they spent so much time talking about or like writing down these nightmares? Is yeah. You want them to happen? <laughs> good, good, good question. Um, so uh, yeah, they, they didn't give the content. Mm -hmm. 
And nightmares are referred to usually as bad dreams. So that's it, right? Just the word for dream, then the word bad. <laughs> they also had a word for good dreams, which was not surprisingly the word dream and then good. Um, <laughs> but, and then the nightmares was, were referred to as euphemisms. So as things that come in order, that uh, terrors that come in order to fall upon a man in the night, you know, or things like that, or, you know, you know, scary things that I see. Um, so they're only referred to when necessary in order to write the rest of the text, which is all about expelling it, getting rid of it, or preventing it. So the uh, headrests, for example, the pillows, will not have the word nightmare on it anywhere. Mm -hmm. In fact, even the word dream doesn't appear on any headrest, but they might have a spell for good sleep going down the front. And then on the sides, they'll be decorated with these sort of superheroes, I'll call them. That sounds better than demons, doesn't it? <laughs> superheroes. One of the reason I don't call them heroes is because superheroes usually have a backstory and these have no backstory. Mm -hmm. There might have been one or it might not have been necessary. You know, it's, it's again... I bring up this example. <laughs> this is helpful. I could create a backstory to it, but but you know, it's just it's just. Mm -hmm. What'd you name it? Viva the thesis fair. <laughs> um, interesting. So so what was was it about Bez that made him so popular? Like why was he the go-to? Um, again, I think he was uh, his general appearance. He looked. A little different. He always looked different, but he had, I don't know, he, he looks, he sticks out his tongue at one time period, and he also looks straight ahead, which is unusual for Egyptian artwork, but he's charming. He just is. He has little, little round cookie ears, little, little round lion ears, and he's got like a little mane, and he's got a tail, um, and you get the impression that he's small also, and um, again, at some periods, he's distinctly dwarf-like, definitely. He has all the features of a chondroplastic dwarfism. Um, early on, he doesn't. Early on, he's rather slim. Um, he has a feminine counterpart, by the way, a female counterpart as well, Bezet, um, who wasn't nearly as popular. Uh, but I think it's just because he was considered a general protector. So he's everybody's buddy. He's everybody's friend. And he could help with all sorts of things. Uh, we often say that he's associated with childhood and children in particular. I don't, I know why Egyptologists say that, but I think that idea needs to be expanded because we find him on so many things associated with adults as well. Um, I don't know, the idea seems to have been that women in ancient Egypt were so fragile and vulnerable and unable to do anything and constantly needing help. Um, that anytime anything protective of this found to protect women and children, I'm like, yeah. <laughs> the old also need help too. And, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of these probably helped people when they were, um, you know, older, anybody's sick, basically anybody who's sick, uh, um, could have them. And he is known already in the old kingdom. So he has a very, very long and rich history in, uh, ancient Egypt as well. Um, so one question I have is, so like, as we're talking, it seems like there is a, there's the separation between, you know, the religion of the common people, you know, the religion of the scribes and the pharaohs. Did the scribes and the pharaohs use these demons as well? Or were they Interesting, like- Interesting, they did. Well, they did to some extent. I mean, the some of the demons, for example, appear on uh, the footboard of the bed that was found in the tomb of Tutankhamun. And Princess Sitamun from that time period also has a chair that has uh, these beings on it as well. And his own headdress has a lovely bez face um, just on the underside of it also. He has a lovely portable headrest, um, uh, which, which um, yeah, has the bez image on it. Um, so they could use them as well. The, the place they don't appear again is in the main temples. Mm -hmm. Tawerit at times can, but, but um, 
otherwise this whole range of, of beings that come in just an amazing assortment of shapes and sizes can appear on funerary papyri, um, which is one play where Sir Bez rarely appears. So for example, in the 18th dynasty book of the dead papyri, there's, he appears one time and then another time as a determinative, that's it. So it's sort of in contrast to he's appearing in life all the time. And there he only appears that, that one time in the book of the dead papyri. Um, so, you know, yeah, different ones. Um, now, if you wanna take him with you to the afterlife, you still can. Uh, many of these headrests ended up in tombs, which is why we have them today, because they were found in tombs and were able to survive. However, some of them show wear, so we know that they were used. Mm -hmm. uh, of the, the so wear we've, been, hmm. we've been mm -hmm. talking a lot about headrests, and mm -hmm. uh, I think this, this might stray a little bit from the talk of demons, but... Um, I was watching one of your lectures um, that you did recently. It was like a, like a panel about um, ancient demons, but you mentioned that they were kind of like what we use for as pillows today. Mm -hmm. And I imagine you know, like, like normal, like stuff comfy pillow. But when I saw a picture of it, I was like, whoa, that's not a pillow. That's, what is that? So did everyone use those in ancient Egypt? Because I was blown away when I saw, you know, that, that headrest. It's, I think it, you know, you know, you have to remember it's hot in Egypt. Right. The last thing you want is a big, fluffy pillow around your head because it's hot. So headrests are actually used in many parts of Africa today. They were used in East Asia. They were used in parts of Polynesia and still are today. So they fulfill a number of functions. Um, one thing they do is they keep your head cooler, especially your neck. Um, they also protect you more from insects. Again, something we tend not to think about in our sterile little environment is, um, I just remember when I was, when I, one time when I was excavating in Egypt, a colleague of mine said, be careful of scorpions. He woke up one time and there was like a little, all these baby scorpions next to his head on the pillow. I was like, ah. Um, so, so they raise your head up. Um, and they also today are used for elaborate hairstyles also to keep them intact. They in the depictions, occasionally you'll see that they actually do have like a little cushion on top. So sometimes they would have probably put a cushion on there. Uh, but experiments have been done. In fact, at the Penn Museum, I came across an article by an Egyptology student who did some experimental archaeology of um, testing it and seeing which way to sleep. Sure enough, you sleep on the side. Um, I always thought you should sleep with your head back though, because then it would put your neck in a really nice position. If you ever go to an osteopath, they will raise your head up actually and hold it up just like a headrest at a, right. about the same height as many of these. Some of them are very tall too, and it might seem as if they're not used, but some of the African ones today, again, I've compared the measurements are the same height. Wow. Yeah. Really they can, yeah, yeah. They can also be used. Sometimes um, today they use them to, uh, let's say you're a herdsman or a shepherd, and you want to rest, but you don't want to really fall asleep into a deep sleep because you know your job is to watch the sheep or goats or whatever. Um, they're also used for that today, and I suspect they were in ancient e Egypt as well. Probably not really pretty decorated ones, but maybe, you know, maybe. Mm -hmm. Wow. So they did have a little bit of a cushion because like from the photos I saw, it seemed like it was just like, like a cradle of wood. And I'm like, there's no way that can be comfortable. There's ones of stone too. Oh gosh. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I suspect those had cushions, but the, the wood ones might not have. Uh, a lot of the ones that are used today don't. Wow. That's super interesting. Um, so I have one more, or I have another question. Uh -huh. um, for these demons, were there any examples of them being like combined or like synchronized with different gods and almost like being deified or were they always considered this like intermediate between the humans and the gods kind of? Yeah, that's an interesting question. We do have examples of ones, um, one for the name, his name is Tutu, who appears, <laughs> yeah, he's kind of a lying guy. Um, he ends up having knife on his feet as well. He initially was sort of known as the master of demons demon master um and he ends up deified he 
becomes a god. And then we have gods who ended up sort of demonized, like poor Seth, who starts off being a good guy, being a strong guy and a defender of the sun god, and eventually gets known as, as, as a nasty, chaotic being who's out to get everybody, which I think must have made him very sad because he didn't start off that way. So yeah, you can, you can have him go both ways. Bez, the Bez image is another example. He becomes really almost deified um, in the uh, uh, Greco-Roman period, and he starts appearing there in temples, um, ones that were used uh, for incubation, for people to go to sleep, to get healing mm -hmm. uh, dreams. So is there a clear point when the use of these demons stopped? Like, was it at the end of, you know, the Egyptian empire as we know it, or, well, I guess not empire, but, you yeah. know. No, I think, well, I think every culture has their own demons. And I think the need for demons, and this isn't my idea, actually, David Frankfurter has written um, quite a bit about this. And I read his work, and it made complete sense. He said that a demonology gets created when the need arises. So, for example, during the plagues, you need to find something to blame for though that that virus or disease that that's you know the, the plague that's killing everybody and so it gets blamed on these creatures and i think it's it was the same in ancient egypt which is why when you suddenly see uh in any culture a development of supernatural beings or more amulets appearing or protective devices I think one of the interesting questions, the first question is to sort of look and see what is being depicted, what is being described, where is it found, when is it from, and then the really interesting question is why, what created the need for it, and this happens all over in, in World War One, um, for example, the European soldiers uh, were really the, the, the level of, a, of, of horrific atrocities that they had to deal with um, was you know, led to the development then too of, of people um, talking to angels. We have letters that were written to gods. We have uh, a lot more people turning to, um, oh, not, not supernatural, uh, spiritualism, for example, at that time period as a response to that extreme anxiety and, and trench art testifies to that as well. There was even cartoons of, of you know, again, these superheroes, supernatural beings that were developed then as a coping mechanism. So I think that's one way to look at it. It's not simply artistic and I, they don't go away. I think which ones appear and um, what they appear on changes over time and their appearance. I mean, in Egypt, you could, you know, you can think of, um, even in Coptic Christianity, you have Saint Anthony, <laughs> you know, going out into the, the desert and being assaulted by all these malevolent demons. Now, his, his um, uh, you know, helpful beings were the great God and, uh, you know, those kinds of beings. But it's the same philosophy. It's the same idea. It's the same concept of putting a name or a manifesting or visualizing something that's otherwise inexplic inex inexplicable and not understandable. And you put a name to it. We did it with COVID, right? You find all these images of the COVID virus as a virus, first of all, just as a picture, as a drawing. And then we have you know, you'll find images of the protectors. You'll find images of the nurses and superhuman superhero con, um, you know, things or the vaccines, even like that counter agent, that benevolent being that's going to help you protect you from the hostile malignant forces. So it's something that always happens. Wow. That's, that's something I haven't thought of, but it makes a lot of sense how, you know, it's something that's in almost ingrained in our humanity, almost since it seems like it's happened since the beginning of us. Um, my mask, one of my favorite masks that I wear now has a superheroes on it. <laughs> Again, to, to, <laughs> right. right. And it's almost like, you know, how we mentioned how like headrests, like they fill the purpose of, you know, like resting your head and you can also decorate them, you know, with, you know, with these protectors, but it seems like our masks today 
fulfill that purpose. Like, yeah, there's a functionality to it, you know, we're keeping everyone safe, but we also have fun decorating them. <laughs> that's right. That's right. And I suspect, because that's always the question, like, who the heck thought of these things? Again, I always picture some Egyptian priest going out into the desert or some Egyptian scroll and going, uh, coming back, oh, I have this great idea. We'll make this walking sun disc with a knife on its foot. I'm like, okay, <laughs> that'll work. <laughs> Let's try it and see if it catches on. <laughs> and and uh, it's always, I, I'd love to think of who, who thought of these things, you know, and um, that might be part of it too at certain time periods. Again, this is this goes into an area that's not my expertise at all, but the development of different art styles and and um, craftsmen and the freedom to uh, change um, and do something different. So. That's super interesting. All right, well, that's all the time that we have for today. Um, so, for those of you in the audience, if you have any questions for Kasha, please let them please leave them in the chat, and we will get to them as we see them. Um, oh, and we already have a question. Um, so this one is from Kate Luska. Um, you mentioned that demons are depicted on headrests yeah. slash pillows for sleep. And you talked about how dreams, and you talked about dreams and nightmares. Do we know anything about the impact of headrest demons on dreams or nightmares? No, we don't get, we don't get to know what happens after. It's terrible. We never get to hear what happens after the fact, whether it worked or not. So I suspect that they were, extremely effective for a little while because they proliferate but then i guess they stopped either they stopped working or the need for them dissipated and so they stopped being used there but no this is the frustrating thing we'll find a spell we never know if it works the only clue we get with spells sometimes they end with a thing saying this has been proved a million times effective Wow. And to me, that shows that it's been used as a, on a you know, a, what do they call it? A clinical trial of <laughs> that we would call um, today. Right. It's like this one's 90% effective. This one's maybe only. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I suspect that's why some of them appear at certain time periods and never appear again. I was like, whoa, that didn't work. Your walking sun disc was a bad idea. It's like, <laughs> nah, try again. And, so. and we also saw that with the, like, uh, the depictions of uh, knives on feet, right? Because that was <laughs> yeah. that only occurred for a relatively short amount of time, right? Yeah, yeah. And then it appears again in only Tutu. Tutu does it, and that's it. And it, it was, uh, and yeah. It's kind of interesting when you think like how useful are knives on your feet, but uh, I guess some people thought they had a use if it was depicted. Yeah, yeah. might as well try it. <laughs> One thing I wanted to, is it okay if I just say something really quickly? So yeah. I just had a funny story of how I got interested in dreams at all. And this whole study sort of, which leads to the demons at all. This is just shows how research can be such a fluke. So my father at the father-in-law at the time was a Jungian scholar. And he simply asked me, what do the Egyptians think about dreams? And I said, Wow, that's a really good question. So I asked a friend of mine who I was studying with, and he said, oh, well, they practice dream interpretation all the time, and they did this and that. And I went, huh, I've been reading Egyptian texts for seven years now. Yeah, I studied a long time. Um, <laughs> I really liked it. Um, and I went, I actually haven't come across that at all. And I wonder what they did do. And so that's some, sometimes when these things get started just sort of on a fluke. And actually I was told initially that I wouldn't be able to find enough and to pick a different subject. But, you know, I just went out and said, no, look, I found this and this and this and this and this. <laughs> so, and that led to the demons. And then there we go, <laughs> the full story. All right, that's awesome. Okay, well, um, if no one has any other questions, we're gonna go in. Oh, we do have one, <laughs> make the time. Um, so you mentioned that demons were noticeable yeah. by how they looked, for example, half human, half beast. Were there any other insignia used to label or identify them? Yes, sometimes they lean on the Egyptian words uh, for protection, the sa sign, which again, sort of explicitly states, you know, what this is. It's a symbol, isn't it? As, as well as the word. Um, so, uh, and a lot of the composite beings, they could be parts of animals, human, but also objects. And they could combine 
all three of those in one. So you get these real wacky ones. This is on a mythological papyrus, but you have um, one that's got, uh, what is it? The tail is the head of a snake and the front is the head of a, a falcon with wings and um, I can't, oh, but he's got the body of a lion and, and it, it just gets all these weird little parts put together. Um, and again, some are repeated and some you see only once and that's it. It's like, okay, that didn't work. We actually developed a database and on, I think we looked at just over 200 objects, 200 discrete objects, but on those objects were over 4,400 distinct individual depictions of beings. Wow. Just to show how, so if somebody were to expand the project, <laughs> we could find many, many more. Yeah. Um, we do have one more question. Um, this is also from Kate. Um, Brian would like to know if there are any connections between dreams and the Ba. Ah, well, that's, John Gee has an article on Ba sending, dream sending, which is based on very late period texts and it's very tenuous. Um, in my research, I found none whatsoever, um, unfortunately. It would be nice, would be, would be really interesting, but there's, there's nothing. <laughs> Any book that you recommend? Yes, my book on dreams and nightmares, which um, <laughs> is out of print, but I am rewriting it. That's my next phase. As soon as I'm done uh, teaching here, the next project is to rewrite the book, which I hope to have finished um, um, it shouldn't take me that long, she says, <laughs> knowing full well it'll take much longer. But yes, I'm rewriting because um, uh, I have a book that is, needs, needs desperately, desperately needs updating. And I'm rewriting it to be readable instead of in obtuse academies, which is not very exciting to read. Uh, who interpreted the dreams? Was it the priests or an oracle? Uh, yeah, dream interpretation begins in the New Kingdom, which we have. We have no idea who did it. We have one dictionary of dreams, and um, we don't know. Later on, it was, I suspect, later on, we know it was priests, but it was just one of their jobs. There's no specialist. There's no term for dream interpreter. There's no just individual, you know, uh, specialist in it. It likely was just one of the many jobs of priests. In the New Kingdom, it might, it, it, your guess is as good as mine, it might have been the purview of what was called the wise woman um, in the village. It might, um, you know, uh, have been a priest or just anybody who knew how to read. Again, there's not a lot of evidence for it in the New Kingdom. Most of it comes from the late period and the Greco-Roman period, at which time period it is definitely the priests. Um, and we do have some dream interpreters uh, also, but one of the texts we have, for example, talks about the, the Cretan dream interpreter, and that's found in Egypt. So they're telling somebody, no, 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 go see the Cretan guy, he's really good at this. Uh, so it might've been an import from abroad um, from, cause it's certainly attested earlier in the Akkadian texts. Awesome. So we have it there first, but the Egyptians, as usual, ended up doing it better. Uh, <laughs> it's it's kind of like some technology that gets invented here and then goes overseas and is created better and more efficiently. <laughs> right. The Egyptians yeah. were very good at taking stuff that other people invented and making it their own. Right. Awesome. Okay. So that's all we have time for. We're, we're quickly running out of time. Um, so a big thank you to, doc, to uh, Dr. Kasha for joining us today. Thank you for everyone in the audience who, um, who attended or you know, who left a question. Thank you. Um, we do have one quick announcement and we do have an upcoming event. Uh, we have a Cocktails with a Collection with Dr. Kate Liska and that is on May 20th at 5 p.m. And if you're interested in joining, there is the link that Miranda dropped in the chat. Um, so please do check it out. Again, thank you so much, Dr. Kasha, for joining us. Um, thank you everyone again. Um, and we will be back next season in the fall. So this is our last episode for <laughs> quite a long time. Um, so thank you, everyone. And uh, I'll hope to see you next season.